Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Rubin speaking to you from south of Jerusalem, here in the holy, beautiful land of Israel. Today is the 27th day of the month of ER 5784. It's June 4th, 2024. Today is 42 days, which are six weeks of the Omer. We have one more week to go before Hag Shavuot, the festival of Shavuot. But we have many exciting days even before Shavuot because tonight <coughs> because tonight is the 28th of ER, which is Yom Yerushalayim, Jerusalem Day. The 28th of ER is the day that Jerusalem was reunited, liberated and reunited in the Six-Day War. I believe it was June 7th uh, on, the, it was the, on the secular calendar, but it was the 28th of ER in the Hebrew calendar, and it's become a very, very beloved holiday ever since Yom Yerushalayim. Um, we will be sending out a post this evening on the 28th, uh, inviting everybody to view a series of videos that we, that we made uh, some 15 years ago, I believe. Uh, actually, it was one long interview with the Rabbi Yisra, Yisra Ariel, the founder of the Temple Institute, who was one of the paratroopers who actually liberated the Temple Mount in 1967. And in this interview, he uh, r relates his, uh, his memories, his impressions, his reflections on all that transpired leading up to the war, during the war, the actual liberation of the mountain, and, and what happened afterwards. It's very, very, very uh, moving, I believe. It's, it's, and I think it's a glimpse, a real historic glimpse that you won't get elsewhere because it's personal um, from his own eyes, his own experiences. And uh, it was about a one hour, it wasn't so much an interview, he just, he just related uh, his memories. And uh, we broke it up into 12 different videos uh, a little more bite size, and yes, he speaks in Hebrew. We've translated into English, and but despite the fact, if you don't understand Hebrew, uh, his is a certain understated intensity uh, and pathos, even to 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 what he is saying, to how he is saying it. So I think that comes across. I think you'll find it to be very moving, and uh, you'll learn a lot if you'll take the time and uh, watch these videos. There, you can find them on our website, templeinstitute.org, in the study tools section under Temple Mounts, and under Temple Mount you will find another menu that is called Six Day War Reflections. In any case, uh, Yom Yerushalayim Jerusalem Day is always a cause to celebrate and the following day, actually, Thursday evening, is Rosh Chodesh Sivan. It's the first day of the new month of Sivan, the month of Hag Shibuot, the festival of Shavuot, the month of the receiving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. Hag Shibuot, of course, is also the festival of the Bikurim, of the first fruits. Also the Shtei Lechem, the two loaves of, of wheat uh, that are offered up to inaugurate the the wheat harvest in Israel. And of course next week, I believe it's Tuesday evening, is uh, Hag Shavuot. And not only that, my friends, but we are beginning a new book in our Torah reading, yearly Torah reading, and of course it's the book of Bamidbar, the book of Numbers. And uh, we'll be talking about all these things in just a moment, but I'm going to take a minute or two or three to rant. I don't rant, I don't think, I don't think I rant very frequently on Temple Talk. And I think I try to stay away from politics. And of course, these past eight months, oh, Israel's been at war, a very serious war. In fact, this war is referred to by many people here as Israel's second war of independence is that serious. It is that serious a situation, is an existential war that we must win. And 
I have been talking about that, but I'm going to rant a bit. Joe Biden is a pyromaniac. Joe Biden has proven over and over and over again that he is dead set on the destruction of Israel, no less. Every policy that he attempts to impose on Israel, he attempts to ram down our throats. Every sur surrender that he demands of Israel in Israel's ex existential war against savage genocidal terrorists funded by the very same fascist government of Iran that Biden insists on playing footsie with to this day is intended to bring Israel to its knees and pave the way for the genocide. No less, I'm not trying to be dramatic, bombastic, paving the way for the genocide of the Jews in Israel. If Israel does not win this war, it's over. Israel will win this war. But Biden is doing everything in his power to see Israel burn. He's obsessed with the burning of Israel. And the burning of Israel is not merely a metaphor right now. Missiles launched by Hezbollah from Lebanon yesterday into northern Israel have set off massive forest fires. I mean, you look at these videos and it's it's Armageddon. That's what it looks like. And not only are there massive forest fires in the north, but Palestinian, you know, small-time terrorists are, are setting fires all over Israel. It's that season, right? Summertime. It happens every summer. But uh, Israel is not only completely preoccupied fighting wars, but it's now completely preoccupied fighting fires. Joe Biden is is, I, I, I don't even know what to say, he is public enemy number one to Israel. He, he, he was trying to, get this, you've probably read it, he was trying to convince the European nations not to impose uh, sanctions on Iran. And the actually, the, the Europeans are going ahead to impose those sanctions. They're defying Biden. The one good thing I can say about Biden is that he is so weak, he is so ineffectual, that he hardly has control of anything. Now, his apparent hatred for Israel, despite his professed love of Israel, is either because election concerns, which is pathetic, completely pathetic, but I think uh, there are many things that point to the fact that he will stoop to anything in order to try to get reelected. Or if it's not simply re-election concerns, and I don't really see how he feels like trying to destroy Israel is going to get him re-elected. Uh, so the other possible and I think probable answer is that he really wants to see Israel brought to his knees. And we do know that his, his his security teams and his cabinet are there. There are two types of people in, uh, that that make up most of, of of his administration and and the security teams and even in the Pentagon and they sometimes overlap. They're either uh, Obama holdovers and or uh, people who are actually associated with terrorist organizations who somehow made it to the top of the American security in the Pentagon, in the in the State Department, etc., etc. It's a mess, people. It's a mess. And I'm quite positive that Obama himself is pulling the strings. And I'm quite certain that every evening, maybe even every morning and afternoon that uh, Biden's top advisors are on the phone with Obama and getting their real instructions from him. So Israel is trying to finish up with Hamas in the south and I gotta also you know sp spill some some ire at Israel's, Israel's leadership which has just also been uh, futzing around as they say um, you know, I understand that Biden is making it very difficult, but there comes a time, and it should have come months ago, but there comes a time when, you know, it's our needs, our security, our sovereignty comes first. 
So, you know, we keep going back to these these deals that, that, that Biden concocts and then claims that Israel came up with these deals. And he's probably working with people in Israel who are trying to undermine the government because that's the real goal. The other real goal of, of Biden is to force Netanyahu out. So he's meddling with internal affairs of a democratic country because he doesn't like Netanyahu because Netanyahu won't give him what he wants, which is a, quote, Palestinian state on a silver platter, meaning a terrorist entity that will be the bane of Israel's existence from now until eternity. This is what Biden wants, and he'll try anything in order to achieve it. And, of course, the other thing he wants is some kind of, of Middle East hege- hegemony for Iran. He wants Iran to be the strong, to be the policeman of the Middle East. Why he wants a terrorist, a terrorist regime that its own citizens hate, a terrorist regime that has spread terror all across the world, a terrorist regime that calls not only for the death of Israel, and we see that they mean it, also for the death of the United States, why he wants them to be the strong man in the Middle East. There's something wrong here, folks. There's something wrong. Joe Biden is not fit to be the leader of the free world. And he actually isn't the leader of the free world right now. He's not the leader of anything. I can go on and on and on, but I will spare you. Uh, that is the conclusion of my rant concerning Joe Biden, Yimach Shemo. And again, Joe, I gotta tell you, Hashem promised Avraham all those years ago that those who bless you will be blessed and those who curse you will be cursed. Joe, you're on the way out. You're cursing Israel. You're going to be cursed. You made your choice. You made your bed. You're sleeping in it. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you got a few more months in the White House and then you can toddle on home. So we begin the book of Bamidbar, uh, called Numbers in, in English. It's called Numbers because it begins with a census, a taking a number, taking of the numbers of the uh, military conscription age uh, Israelite males. And uh, but in, in Hebrew, Bamidbar means in the wilderness or in the desert, as you'd like to translate it. The first verse goes like this: Hashem el Moshe Bamidbar. Bamidbar Sinai, Boel Moed, Bechad Lachodesh Hashini, Bashana Hashini, Tlitzetam, Eretz Mitzrayim, Lemor. Okay, Hashem spoke to Moshe in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tent of meeting, on the first day of the second month in the second year after the exodus from the land of Egypt, saying. So, we are beginning the second year in the wilderness. Um, the first of the second month, it was actually the first of this now outgoing month of Iyar. So in this one year, Israel has left Egypt, crossed the Sea of Reeds, um, is now being nourished by manna every day. They've been to Mount Sinai, received the Torah, um, and they've, they've, they haven't yet, no, they've built, they've built a tabernacle They've accomplished a lot in this year, and so all eyes are on the land of Israel, and that's what they're getting ready for, to enter the land of Israel. Plan A is uh, to now head toward Israel, the land of Canaan, Canaan, and conquer it. And uh, so in order to do that, Israel needs an army. So the uh, numbers are, are taken, and there's a census, and the book of the, the Parsha the Bamidbar, beginning of the Book of Numbers, is all about that census and about the um, the the can- encampments of Israel of the twelve tribes and how they're laid out uh, um, around the tabernacle. Uh, well, certainly, of course, to to protect the tabernacle, and um, there are basically seems that it's four different divisions. There's the eastern front, the western front, the northern front, and the southern front. And it's all laid out here. Each of the 
each of the uh, tribal encampments raises a banner, its own, in, uh, its own uh, insignia, its own flag, and uh, there's a lot of tradition about that. We posted uh, a very, very interesting uh, midrash about the flags uh, yesterday on our Facebook page. You're welcome to check that out. And then, of course, the census of the Levites from the tribe of Levi is taken. They are not included in the census of the um, uh, the first census, which is intended for the um, purpose of raising an army, because they will not serve in the army. They're serving in the tabernacle, in the Mishkan. That is their responsibility. And so they are, they are counted not... Uh, as tribes, since they are a single tribe, they are counted as families, and there's three major families. There's the Kahat family, the Gershon family, and the Marari family, and they have encampments to the south and west and north of the tabernacle, right adjacent to the tabernacle, and then to the east is a tent um, in which Moshe resides, and Aaron and Aaron's sons are also stationed there. So this is this is how uh, Israel intends to move forward in the wilderness as they approach the land of Israel. And in the upcoming Torah readings, we'll be reading, of course, how uh, about the uh, trumpets that they'll sound in order to signal for the for the uh, that it's time to go. When they know that it's time to go when the when the cloud of glory, the Anana Kavod, raises up off the tabernacle. That means that Hashem wants them to move forward, and of course, when it, when that uh, cloud descends again, that's where they will pitch. That's where they will pitch their tents and set up camp again. And of course, it's not only the the people and their provisions and their and their livestock and their and their tents that have to be that have to be packed up and and moved. But of course, the tabernacle itself and all its vessels, and that is the responsibility of these Levites. And there is in uh, the, our Parsha this week a description of, of who's, which families are in charge of what. And um, there's more detail about that in upcoming uh, uh, chapters of, of the Book of Numbers. But everything is in place. Everything is ready to move forward. So, you know, if we coordinate our, synchronize our, our watches, we can say that... Um, they should be entering into the land of Israel, I imagine, within a matter of months. But of course, spoiler alert, because I think we all know that it didn't happen as planned because of what we'll be reading in a, in a few weeks, and that is, of course, the sin of the spies, which caused a delay of 39 years, 39 years uh, before Israel would actually enter into the land and but that is still in the future and as far as everybody knows everybody who's in the wilderness um, they're getting ready to move in and I imagine there's a lot of excitement amongst the Israelites because um, God's promise uh, looks like it's going to be coming true soon of course God's promise does depend on uh, their willing, their being willing to fight. Because God's promises aren't, you know, they're not given on a silver platter. They have to be earned. And we have to work for them because we have a covenant. We have an agreement. We have a contract with Hashem and we each have our responsibilities. So there's no free lunch. You might say, what about the manna? The manna wasn't a free lunch either. We know when the manna fell, Israel had to learn the rules about collecting manna. They had to learn the rules about Shabbat. And they have to abide by them. It's a quid pro quo. And as long as we're doing what we need to be doing, we know that Hashem will be doing what He has promised to do. And uh, if things go south... So they, as they say, um, we know that uh, we need to look inward for the reason. Because we've somehow 
failed. It may be obvious or it may not be so obvious what we've done wrong, but we need to look inward and make the corrections. That's the responsibility uh, of being a partner with Hashem in this world. A responsibility and a tremendous privilege because in this partnership we we discover ourselves and we are able to fulfill our our freedom uh, and our potential as individuals and as a nation so that's in a nutshell that is Parshat Bamidbar let's talk a few minutes about again about Yom Yerushalayim it's been 57 years since Israel liberated the Temple Mount and um, it's been 57 years since Jews have been going up to the Temple Mount and unfortunately because of some very rash and foolish decisions that were made immediately after liberating the Temple Mount by Israel's then uh, political and military leaders um, it was agreed that Jews would not have the right, the privilege to pray in the Temple Mount that the administration of the Temple Mount would be uh, under the jurisdiction of the Muslim Waqf run by Jordan and they would make the rules and so this has been a horrible decision that we've been um, up against and fighting against for all these decades and as you know only in the past five years um, have we made any headway in getting a little bit of freedom on the Temple Mount freedom to pray and again our right to pray on the Temple Mount is enshrined in, in, in Israeli law not to mention it's a mitzvah it means it's enshrined in Torah law but it's enshrined in Israeli law and it's just a matter of whether the police are going to um, allow Israeli law to to flourish or or not and unfortunately the the Supreme Court in Israel which has had on more than one case concerning Jewish rights to pray on the Temple Mount has always um, held up that Jews certainly have the right to pray in the Temple Mount as well as non-Jews, all non-Muslims, everybody has the right to pray in the Temple Mount but they say they allow for the police to make their decisions based on security concerns which basically means the police can do what they want and that ultimately boils down to whoever, whichever, whatever policeman is on the Temple Mount that morning can decide for himself whether he's going to arrest a Jew for praying or for bowing down or whatever now, like I said, the situation has gotten much better and there's much more tolerance, to use that word, for Jewish prayer in the Temple Mount. Still, the hours are extremely limited and there's a whole lot of work to be done. Uh, God willing, uh, there'll be a large numbers of Jews going up to the Temple Mount tomorrow and God willing, it'll, go, it'll happen peacefully. Um, and why do I mention that? It's the heart of what the liberation of Jerusalem and the reunification of Jerusalem is really supposed to be all about. Yes, Jerusalem's a beautiful city now. There's no wall, there's no barbed wire separating it. Um, there are Jewish communities, you know, to the in, in east and west and north and south Jerusalem. And uh, it's a wonderful city. But at the heart of that city, is the Temple Mount and it's it's bleeding because we are not doing what we need to do and again it sends that we're not doing what we need to do in the place which is the most important most significant place to us as Jews as a Jewish nation it sends a message to all our enemies a message of weakness a message of uh, lack of certainty on our part, lack of I identity, which they see as a green light to attack us. So you want to really bury Hamas so deep they can never pop up again. 
you have to liberate once again the Temple Mount, this time really liberate it and give Jews um, access 24-7 and freedom of prayer and assembly on the Temple Mount. That's going to put the nail in the coffin of our enemies. It might not happen in a minute, but when they see us exercising our rights as Jews and they see us honoring our God, they will get the message and back off. And we'll get the message and walk upright and be strong and be proud and won't have to to uh, play games with with Joe Biden about our future. That's Yom Yerushalayim. Uh, so I hope it's uh, it is celebrated uh, very festively and joyfully, and that uh, we'll have good news um, on Yom Yerushalayim. And of course, we are looking, always praying for good news concerning our hostages. Again, more and more we're discovering have been killed while in captivity. And uh, we need to win this war. Uh, ASAP. Win it and win it big. Uh, so, right after Yom Yerushalayim, Thursday evening, Friday, is the first day of the month of Sivan, Rosh Chodesh Sivan. It is the third month of the year and of course the month of the festival of Shavuot we will uh, have one more temple talk before Shavuot so we'll talk at length about Shavuot on the following next week's temple talk but um, Shavuot in temple times was of course the festival of the Bikurim the first fruits uh, because this is the time of year when the first fruits are ripening. And it, it's important to note that first fruits, because not every first fruit is going to really have appeared yet uh, this season or be ripe yet. So it's the beginning of the season of bringing the first fruits. The first fruits can be brought all through the summer and even in some cases, I believe, past Sukkot. Um... But this is the beginning, and of course, when the first fruits are brought on Shavuot, there is the beautiful ceremony that we read about in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, Parshat Kitavo. I don't have in front of me which chapter it is. It's toward the toward the end of Deuteronomy. Of course, when you enter into the land, you will bring your first fruits uh, up to the temple, and you'll stand by the altar and present them to the Kohen. And there's a certain vidui, a certain uh, statement that was said in that ceremony. Um, and it's a very beautiful time of year. It's a very beautiful ceremony. It was also the the lechem, shte lechem, uh, the two loaves uh, offering of wheat, right? We had the barley offering on the second day of Passover because that was the season of the harvest of the barley. And then on Shavuot, it's the season of the harvest of the wheat. And uh, traditionally, we make a connection between wheat and barley and the counting of the Omer. Of course, the counting of the Omer, the Omer refers to the barley offering itself. And the counting of the Omer begins with that day of the barley offering, the Omer offering. And we count those seven full weeks, 49 days between that second day of Passover and the eve of Shavuot. And of course, we know as we count up, as we're counting up, adding another, another number each day, another day each day, that it's part of a process of lifting ourselves up and refining ourselves and, and building ourselves up spiritually in order to be ready spiritually to receive the Torah on Shavuot because every year we receive it anew and because we have this understanding that when Israel was taken out of 
Egypt by Hashem. They weren't spiritually. They were, they were still in a very, very distressed state. They had been in Egypt, been immersed in Egyptian uh, idolatry and Egyptian corruption, um, and uh, Egyptian um, dissolution, and uh, and Hashem. We're told took them out. He couldn't wait any longer. They had to leave. He had to be brought out because if they stayed any longer in Egypt, they could have been irretrievably lost. They would have been sunken so deep in the impurities of Egypt. So they left uh, Egypt on the fifteenth of of uh, Nisan. But from there, that journey from there to Mount Sinai, the fifty-day journey was also a journey of spiritual journey and of course they were they were learning Torah even before they received Torah God was instructing them how to behave we see that very clearly with the with the mana and they were learning slowly what it meant to be a free people what it meant to be a people with responsibilities what it meant to be in charge of time to be in charge of uh, your, yourselves, your own goals as a nation, etc., etc. So finally, by the time um, Israel arrived at Mount Sinai, they were ready for receiving Torah. Now we also um, repeat this process every year. We always need refining. We always need improvement. There's always what to work on uh, in ourselves. So we take these 49 days of the counting of the Omer to to lift ourselves up and raise ourselves up and prepare ourselves and make ourselves ready for receiving Torah. And the parallel here is that barley, at least in the time of our forefathers, was was uh, the grain that was by and large uh, used for feeding livestock. Um, it was so it had a lower status, uh, as it were, spiritually than wheat. So. The, the offering of the of the two loaves of wheat in the temple on on Shavuot is symbolic of the fact that Israel has lifted itself up and raised itself up and has become more spiritually refined in order to receive the Torah. So there is a parallel between the crude barley and the more refined wheat, and the lower state of spiritual. Um, spiritual purity at the beginning of our journey in the heightened state of spiritual purity um, as we clo uh, approach and, and prepare for receiving the Torah. So we're getting very close to that moment. Like I said before, this we've just completed the 42nd day. Today is the 42nd day of the Omer, meaning we've completed six weeks, so there's w exactly one more week before um, the completion of the Sfirah to Omer, the counting of the Omer, and receiving the Torah, and celebrating Shavuot. So there, we're at, there we are, and here we are, getting ready to receive the Torah, uh, lifting ourselves up, getting ready to celebrate Yom Yerushalayim, you know, when, when the you can see that uh, Israel, that, that Jerusalem was liberated just days before Shavuot, and um, that first Shavuot following the liberation of Jerusalem was incredibly dramatic and emotional for the people of Israel who were able to arrive at the Western Wall, the foot of the Temple Mount, for the first time since the birth of the state, 19 years earlier. Here's the music. Thank you so much for being with me. Temple Talk.